गुरुर्ब्रह्मा गुरुर्विष्णु गुरुर्देव महेश्वर गुर साक्षात् परम ब्रह्म तस्म श्री गुरव नम लेट नो समथिंग अबाउट द लाइफ ऑफ शंकराचार्य रिगार्डिंग जगद्गुरु शंकराचार्य हू इज जनरली वेल नोन टू टू आल आल ऑफ अस रिगार्डिंग हिम देर आर देर आर मेनी मेनी स्टोरीज सम ऑफ देम आर नॉट एक्सेप्टेड बै हिस्टोरियन सो पीपल हैव जनरली ए क्यूरियासीटी टू नो वाट एग्जैक्टली ई मीन वाट ईवेंट्स ऑफ हिज लाइफ आर 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 रियली हिस्टारिकल सो सम पीपल हैव डन ए स्टडी मेनी पीपल वाई सम पीपल many people have done the study to find out only the core historical portion uh, separated from uh, the myths and uh, and uh, what you call fictional portion so one of them is our swami ji sachidanandendra swami ji himself tried and found out a few unanimously agreed points which are unanimously agreed by traditional people modern sanskrit scholars uh, everybody and you find some solid evidence also for these points i mean the life of historical life of shankaracharya this helps us this this life of uh, shankaracharya purely based upon history or acceptable to historians let us say this life can be can be introduced in our school in our curriculum also so there is no uh, objection to anybody so i feel i touch only those points first thing is shankaracharya was born in kerala in kerala the name of the village is kalati kaladi in fact say kaladi is well known place it falls in the present period ernakulam district of present days second point in his life is in his very young age he was a very small boy at that time his father passed away so these points which we are discussing are commonly found in all his sanskrit biographies unanimously agreed points so he became orphan in such a young age only mother was alive and no father so but he was a sharp boy regarding his mind he was a sharp boy and his education so in a very young age of around 5 years old 5 years at such a age he was he being a very sharp boy he he was sent to gurukula and he studied the veda vedangas and puranas very quickly within a short period some people say even in 3 years only by the age of 8 he completed all the shastras so he was very intelligent sharp so it is a very rare to find in such a young age next we can say when he came back home he was a he was a more spiritually inclined person he was a spiritually inclined person so he was always looking for a spiritual sadhana and a spiritual life so in india we have a two ways one is people staying at home as a householder also pursue some spiritual uh, life spiritual sadhanas and there are some who who take to sanyasa who renounce and live as a sanyasi so but for shankara uh, since he is very young and uh, he was inclined spiritually he felt a renunciation was a right for him his his mind in such a young age of around 8 people say so that requires a great maturity it is not a sharpness alone see sharpness alone is not enough to take to spiritual life it requires a, a mature understanding of life so the life experiences money status and worldly pleasures how they are superficial tentative and the human heart really needs something deeper one 
and the uh, something deeper deeper experience alone can satisfy that spiritual need of a human a human being therefore that that the spiritual need uh, shankaracharya has realized in a very young age in fact at uh, at one stage every human being has to has to uh, realize a need of this a deeper need a deeper spirituality or a spiritual goal at some stage some people realize it at very late age after 60 after retirement some people at the age of 50 or 40 30 but like rare people like shankaracharya in his young age of 80 years old so most of the people uh, at such age are still in a playful mood they want to play things and then still uh, play with friends and then wants things to play and with friends and all and still they want to live a life they want to enjoy and live life only these things but even such a age you can see he has a maturity of a very old man of 70 60 70 or even 80 years old so that is a this this you can see in his all his biographies this is commonly touched so with this detachment with this uh, vairagyam and a, a serious spiritual inclination with this he left his house so in order to search for the truth one needs a guru or at least a guide he needs a company of his spiritual seekers so he thought that and in the tradition uh, traditional life generally you hear that some people become renunciates sanyasis like that so he got an idea that he should renounce so there are some stories about them but they are not unanimously agreed so we are touching only a very historical uh, historically acceptable points along so he he renounced his life where he was born that worldly life the, the mother and house everything at such an young age proceeded from that towards north so this shows his maturity and a uh, Uh, search for truth because at such an young age he was a very bold man because he has to leave his life in those days there were no good transport facility he has to walk through forests wild life and the towns and villages he has to beg for food so that way he walked miles and miles together for months together and reaches somewhere in north india in search of a guru when he goes there he finds one guru luckily and he lives under him for some time and learns whatever spiritual teaching guru offers so he with under his guru he received knowledge spiritual sadhanas since he was already a mature man and sincerely seeking so a little bit of teaching a little bit of guidance was good enough for him so he 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 picked up well and he transformed himself very fast and he he re, he realized the goal of the goal of life with the help of guru ji's teaching so he was a traditional man naturally so he was instructed through upanishads and you can see through his writings he was well based on upanishads veda and mainly upanishads and bhagavad gita because he was a traditional man and he and for even ancient days these vedic portions the last portion of the veda upanishad was was generally studied by most of the spiritual seekers and that was considered as a good guidance so after attaining the goal of his life he felt that his life is fulfilled now he felt an inner urge to to help others see so so he from from there from his guru's place he left to, left to kashi so this is also recorded in his life biographies that he went to kashi he visited kashi and stayed there for some time he went to kashi this is certain he wrote commentaries mainly on these three sets of books one brahma sutras 10 upanishads and bhagavad gita and the fourth one is an independent work which he, which he wrote that is upadesha sahasri there are 
certain other books but there are some disputes there are many books small and big attributed to shankara but uh, both with his internal evidence and external evidence some scholars differ disagree therefore we leave we leave, leave out those things which are unanimously agreed by all traditional scholars and modern research scholars uh, we accept only those points so shankara wrote commentaries on these things so kashi was a place of scholars for vedantins for all spiritual seekers it is a very holy holy place from time immemorial therefore any philosopher who wants to discuss with scholars tries to who wants to convince them who wants his philosophy to be accepted by people he would generally go to kashi and try to discuss and debate with people so that's what shankaracharya did so he he met many scholars there and he talked to people all the scholars he also discussed debated with many scholars and convinced them of his philosophy this is also when he, uh, an important even he event in his life one is he he learned for himself then he out of that compassion for the society he wanted to teach and propagate it in the society the scholars he he convinced in kashi after that he wanted to travel all over india because the scholars are scattered all over india so that also he did in his life he traveled all over india on foot and convinced people with debate and made them his disciples two things you can find some of the scholars he convinced some of the people who are already vedantins with a minor corrections with a few corrections he 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 brought them to the right teaching right understanding of the truth and there were some people fresh people came who were really spiritual seekers seeing hearing shankara's uh, name and fame in the society they approached him so he accepted them as disciples so among his uh, well known disciples you find these two kinds of disciple some are fresh disciple some are already good scholars established in their own schools of philosophy he debated with them convinced them inspired them transformed them and made them to follow his line of teaching and made them his disciples so this also you find regarding his teaching shankara acharya is an advaitin is well well known so he is a follower of advaita philosophy which means the jiva jiva means the individual soul is in its essential nature in its ultimate nature is one with the totality one with the total consciousness of the universe so the consciousness which is the core of oneself is the same consciousness which is the truth of the universe if you put it in simple words the truth of the individual is the truth of the whole universe so you have to transcend your individuality and the worldly experiences so at that level that is an experience so advaita is an experience advaita is not a matter of an interaction with people because when you interact with people in society naturally people are different things are different here is one person and another person in all our interactions there is duality and it is bound to be there so what shankara told is in his absolute truth that is in the core of the atma and the core of the universe is one and this advaita is a matter of an experience it is not a matter of relationship in relationship naturally a person who transcends his individuality and ego and still he acts just like in a drama oh, see a, a, a role when you take up in a drama you don't identify with the role the good and bad of the role don't touch you your inner core remains untouched still you play that role more playfully therefore he is an egoless person naturally he will be dealing with people more lovingly compassionately without any prejudice and ego and hatred and all so that's natural but the truth itself is 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 a matter of an experience not a matter of interaction in interaction you will be generally loving and kind and compassionate so that love and compassion expresses uh, uh, according to the situation according to the situation you express in different ways but in his basic understanding advaita is a matter of experience which helps you to transcend your ego 
transcend your ego and then thereafter when you live your life you will be living more like a playful drama drama in the sense the good and bad of life all the life activities you do seriously but you remain unaffected untouched by the uh, good and bad of it the positive and negative results of it so that is an experience of advaita so this advaita uh, is not a new school which shankaracharya established regarding this advaita we we have to say shankaracharya did not found a new school of philosophy called advaita he only explained advaita which existed before him more convincingly and widely propagated it this is very important point because some people uh, even in the traditional circle also some people think that shankara wrote freshly a new commentary advaitic commentary or he taught advaita but uh, if you look at shankara's charya's writings some people think that uh, advaita as a philosophy did not exist before shankara and it is a shankara who brought it newly how he brought it people imagine that he borrowed it from outside Ved- vedic religion or he himself innovated and uh, and found himself it but uh, both of them are not true because shankara always took upanishads bhagavad gita as a basis for his teaching so he found very uh sufficient ground in his in his upanishad salam in the upanishads for every argument of him he found a very solid evidence in the upanishads and bhagavad gita and the second thing is he quotes acharyas before him he quotes some of the acharyas uh, for example dravida acharya and then brahmanandi like a few people upavarsha these are the achary these were the acharyas who existed before him he quotes some of their statements some of their ideas openly uh, in support of advaita and he says clearly they were advaitins uh, and in upanishads and bhagavad gita up puranas we can see clear statements of advaita so there was no need for him to found a new school of philosophy uh, we can say that he presented them more convincingly by refuting by certain misunderstandings by correcting certain misunderstandings we can say that there was no need to also to found and he 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 often quotes a tradition he always says sampradaya guru sampradaya guru he, he, he often refers to this point that there was sampradaya a person should learn from sampradaya learn from guru and he always refers to his previous gurus and sampradaya not only he his grand guru gaudapada to refers to his earlier tradition vedanteshu vichakshanai he like this a statement like this in his in his gaudapadas in his writings he says that he says there are vedantic gurus prior to him they also say like this i learned from him gaudapada was referring to vedantic gurus prior to him he was referring to them so he says clearly there is a tradition before him ha ah, one more very important point which uh, many of the people both traditional as well as modern people miss it that we find a strong evidence in his writings only very important statement which i say that this credit goes to our guru ji swami ji sachidanandendra saraswati ha ah, so swami ji sachidanandendra saraswati of holy narsapur ashram it came to his attention and he brought out he popularized this statement during his time there were 13 schools of philosophy based on upanishads all these 13 are upanishadic based philosophies and shankara acharya he refers all of them in 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 his writings one one interesting point about these is all of them were advaitin only all of them accepted advaita as the final truth to be attained in the state of moksha before in during the state of ignorance during the state of bondage they say jiva ishwara is different but in that final stage of moksha jiva is going to become one with brahman so all these 13 schools talk of jiva brahma ekatvam in moksha state so uh, when there was already advaita and uh, there is no need for him to found and uh, he doesn't refer to 
any dvaita school dvaita means in the moksha kala in the state of moksha jiva being different from brahman this uh, this this kind of philosophy never existed based upon upanishads there were sankhya vaisheshika and such schools they were indirectly based upon upanishads but they were not directly based upon upanishads they were not directly commenting on upanishads though they referred respected upanishads and all and quoted here and there so so in shankara's period dvaitins means only sankhya vaisheshika and only mimamsa kind such people only but the philosophies which talk of moksha and directly based upon upanishads all such were only advaitins i quote here his own statement it is a sanskrit statement i say sarvopanishatsuhi vijnanaatmanah paramaatmana ekatva pratyayo vidhiyate iti avipratipattihi sarvesham upanishadvadinam the 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 quoted shankara statement means this all the followers of upanishads agree unanimously that all the upanishads teach the unity of jeevatman with paramatman in the state of moksha this statement occurs in brahadaranyaka bhashya uh, 2120 second adhyaya first brahmana 20th mantra so this this shows clearly he was not a founder of advaita as a new school so he only propagated he learned himself he himself learned from the tradition from a guru and uh, uh, convinced the people explained to them correct, corrected the minor mistakes within the advaita tradition a few mistakes a few misunderstandings he corrected them he brought out very clearly the sadhana truth and how to understand according to anubhava he brought them out very very clearly and wrote them in the form of book commentaries and propagated among the people so there is a tradition of his disciples so the disciple taught next disciple that way the tradition has come until now so therefore the conclusion is neither he borrowed his school of advaita from somebody such as buddhism or somebody else nor there was any need for him to found it newly so this is very a uh, very important point and this can be seen uh, i mean you, you can see the evidence for it in his writings very clearly this point generally is is misunderstood by many people